This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Garrett. Brought to you by TheStreet.com. Interactive financial multimedia tools for an ever-changing financial world. Our dividend stock advisor guides and helps generate income during a period of low interest rates. Real money helps you think through ideas for investing and trading stocks. Action Alerts Plus is a charitable trust portfolio that provides trade-by-trade strategies. Online, mobile, social media. We are thestreet.com. Shorter lines, unemployment claims dropped to the lowest level in more than five years, and that lights a fire under stocks, sending the Dow up triple digits. And mutual experience. We'll talk about the $27 trillion global mutual fund industry with the CEO of Franklin Templeton. And more green for your groceries. The numbers are in, and you might be surprised what it means for your food bill. All of that and more on this nightly business report for Thursday, May 2nd, 2013. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sue Herrera. Susie is in Omaha getting ready for the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting. And Sue, I'm Tyler Matheson in Washington at the big Investment Company Institute. It's their 55th annual meeting, and we will talk about the $27 trillion global mutual fund business with Greg Johnson, the CEO of one of the biggest, Franklin Templeton. But first, Sue, it seems like all of yesterday's sellers turned around and became buyers today. They sure did, Ty. Sell in May? Well, not today. Stocks surged higher with traders make, taking back and making back all of the losses from yesterday. And that's after first-time jobless claims fell by 18,000 last week, dropping to a more than five-year low and on hopes that an interest rate cut by the European Central Bank will help jumpstart the Eurozone economy. Well, taking a look at how the numbers finished on Wall Street, the Dow rose 130 points, the Nasdaq was up 41 on the strength of technology stocks, and the S&P 500 added nearly 15, just enough to reach another all-time closing high. Well, Sue, in addition to the weekly jobless claims numbers, planned layoffs in April dipped 23 percent to their lowest levels of the year so far. That according uh, to the uh, monthly survey from the outplacement firm Challenger, Gray and Christmas. So with tomorrow's jobs report looming on everybody's mind on Wall Street and Main Street, let's talk to John Challenger. Mr. Challenger, welcome. Good to have you with us. You know, one of the things that struck me, apart from the individual monthly numbers for April, which were down uh, in terms of uh, planned layoffs from March was the fact that this year's numbers cumulatively, the year so far, almost exactly matched the number of layoffs planned at this time a year ago. What does that tell you? Well, the layoffs have been steady uh, this year. Uh, they haven't been heavy, though. These numbers are very light. These were the lowest numbers we'd seen, uh, monthly numbers for layoffs, since December. You combine that with these very low weekly jobs claims, and those were expected to go up. So they came down, a big surprise. I think that fueled the market, but it also fueled hopes uh, that more companies are poised to do some of the hiring that's been missing uh, over the last several years. We can certainly hope that that's the case, John, but there were certain sectors or areas, if you will, that saw more job cuts than others. What sectors were those? Well, we saw heavy job cuts, uh, heaviest uh, in retail. Uh, retail has been hit, uh, hit hard. Consumer spending has been down. There's real concern uh, that with the payroll uh, uh, tax hikes, the consumers just don't have as much money in their uh, pockets. Mm -hmm. Consumer confidence is not strong. So retail seems to be one of the uh, areas uh, that's getting hit hard. But there are areas that are growing, too. Such as? Are well, there health care. Oh, good. You know, health care, energy, ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, housing, construction. Um, those are areas that have been seeing job growth uh, over the first quarter uh, in the economy. Are you seeing, John, any indication that the uh, federal spending cuts, the so-called sequester, uh, is driving any layoffs in a measurable way? Well, we didn't see it this month in terms of government job cuts or even defense industry job cuts, but we know that that's coming. Uh, certainly those budgets are being slashed. Those kinds of announcements are going to be um, certainly ones we see uh, in the summer uh, throughout 2013 because they're just not going to be as much uh, in the budgets to go around. So we will see more job cuts there uh, going forward. You know, John, I find it interesting that health care is on the list, yet when you talk to 
you know, stock analysts, they say that healthcare is the area in many cases it, that's starting to grow. So why would that particular area see a significant number of job cuts? Well, healthcare, we saw some job cuts, but it is an area, you know, where we are seeing growth. That's what I was saying. Healthcare is, uh, there's always change going on in every mm -hmm. sector, but healthcare uh, has been creating jobs consistently, net new jobs, really uh, more than any other sector in the economy. And with the new health care laws coming on board, there's another 30, 40 million people who will have access to health care services that really didn't before, at least not to this degree. So health care is likely to be a, a net job creator for some time to come. John, why do these numbers seem, or correct me if I'm incorrect, why do they seem so lumpy, so volatile? Uh, the February federal jobs report was, uh, was very good. Then March turned out not to be good. Uh, your numbers indicate a similar kind of lumpiness. Well, you know, certainly um, it depends on sometimes uh, uh, situations that uh, occur month by month. The weather affected job creation uh, seemingly in the month of March, where just 88,000 jobs were created. In the month before, it was almost 250,000 jobs. So you have to look at these numbers not on a just a, a week by week base in the, uh, basis in the case of the jobless claims, or even on a monthly basis sometimes in the case of the unemployment rep, uh, report, but more by quarter, by what's happening. And one of the key uh, issues out here right now is that we are seeing job openings uh, really uh, at a, uh, a, now at a very high level, highest in five years. In fact, right. the real, um, uh, yeah, it's tied right into the fact that jobless claims, weekly jobless claims, that's layoffs, are at a five-year low job openings that are a five-year high, you would think, unless this economy stalls, we're going to see more job growth and the unemployment uh, rate drop uh, as we Alrighty. move forward into the new year, into the summer. John Challenger, John Challenger, thank you very much for being with us. John yep. is with Challenger Gray and Christmas. Well, Thai earnings news out of General Motors also helped set the tone for stocks today. Four years after two of Detroit's big three were bailed out by the government, the automakers seem to be on a roll again. Phil LeBeau has more. Things are picking up on America's assembly lines. Just look at Ford's plant outside Kansas City, where they're adding a thousand new jobs and a third shift to keep up with demand for F-Series pickups. Now's the time to add more production because we're very bullish on our sales. You know, we've had our F-Series sales grow 19% so far this year in the U.S., 26% in Canada, and now's the time with the auto industry growing. F-Series sales have steadily improved in recent years. But dealers say they're really in demand now because contractors have the cash to buy a new truck thanks to the housing market coming back. I've been saying for a long time that when housing kicks in and with the recovery going on in energy that pickup truck sales would be there and uh, it's a very strong year for pickup truck sales. America's auto industry hasn't been this strong in decades. Sales are up and so is employment in the industry with nearly 100,000 jobs added in the last two years. But most importantly, the big three are all profitable. Today, GM said it made almost a billion dollars last quarter. It was a solid quarter and a good start to the year, very much on plan from our point of view. We're really getting into the heart of all of our launch activity that we've been talking about for some time now. You see that starting to show up in the top line. With pent-up demand driving sales and automakers keeping costs in check, Many believe America's auto industry is at the start of an extended, profitable run. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. To market focus now and AIG reporting after today's close. The big insurer beat earnings estimates with profits of $2 billion. That was above what the street was expecting, but they did miss on revenue. AIG shares were up more than 2% ahead of the report to 42.13 and added more in after-hours trading. Also, after the close, Gilead Sciences reported increased sales of its antiviral treatments, but profits and revenues were light. The company repeated its full-year guidance. Shares were up 4 percent at 52.18 before that report. Ty? Well, Sue, uh, LinkedIn's profit grew in the first quarter on higher membership numbers and premium subscriptions. Uh, the company raised its full-year guidance but said its second quarter revenue will be below the estimates of the market. Now, shares closed 3.5% higher to $201.67, then dropped sharply uh, on that second forecast. 
Intel has named an insider as its new CEO, Brian Krasanich, a 30-year veteran at Intel. Krasanich has been chief operating officer since early last year. Investors didn't really react sharply to this news, but shares of Intel have been floundering over the past year, off more than 17 percent. Sue? The U.S. unit of Dutch insurer and retirement planner ING hit the street today as shares debuted on the New York Stock Exchange. After pricing below the initial range at $19.50 a share, the stock closed up about 7.5% to 20.97. Bit earlier today, I sat down with the company's CEO, Rodney Martin, and began by asking him about the future of the company. ING Group, as a result of the European Commission agreement, uh, had to divest the insurance assets from the uh, the bank. <clears throat> the, the, the IPO of uh, ING US was part of that. The bank will re be retaining the name ING, um, and we planned a very orderly process. So we will continue to brand ING through the end of 2014 when ING Group deconsolidates. Um, and the, the sell down is 25% at listing, as we just did, 50%, more than 50% by the end of 2014, and sue 100% by uh, 2016. So we, we are introducing our ticker, ticker symbol today as Voya, and we will begin commercially branding Voya Financials beginning uh, uh, in uh, 2015. It seems as though it's aptly named because it stands for Voyage, basically. You're trying to help. Uh, the consumers that you serve on their voyage to and through retirement. Is that a correct interpretation? That's a perfect interpretation, Sue. So, and uh, <clears throat> we, we are now the uh, one of the largest publicly listed retirement-focused organizations. Our aspiration is to be viewed as America's retirement company. We've got 13 million customers, $460 billion of assets, and we're the, one of the largest players in the U.S. serving the needs. And it's one of the biggest problems Americans face today, and that's preparedness for retirement. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of the things that we found, though, is that after the 08 financial crisis, a lot of the baby boomers and others certainly backed away from the equities market, backed away from financial instruments because they didn't trust the market. How do you lure that group back, especially since they're probably underfunded for their retirement? So you're absolutely correct. And it's really built around <coughs> our, our, our strategy of retirement readiness, and that's preparing people both on the asset accumulation side, the, the protection side, the what happens if component, and then the distribution side, so to and as you pointed out, through retirement. And it's a combination of kind of slow and steady movement. People will have moved back into the market uh, cautiously. We're, you know, retirement is a long-term plan, and, and, and that's really, again, why we've chosen uh, the abstract of Voyage, Voya, because uh, we, we think retirement is not just a destination, it's preparing and being secure in however you as an individual or I uh, choose to uh, define retirement. It's a tough environment on the one hand uh, because it's a, it's a low or no interest rate environment. So it's tough for you to invest your client's money and get a return, but it's also harder for you to make money with a low interest rate or no interest rate environment. It is, but companies like ours and, 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 and many other fine companies are you know, long-term investors. Uh, retirement is a long-term objective, and uh, you know, we, we go through cycles. We happen to be in a lower interest rate cycle today, but many other countries uh, face the same thing. So again, I think a prudent and steady course, uh, both from an investment um, perspective as an individual, or frankly, as a company, is, uh, is, a, is a prudent uh, way to go forward. And a few numbers to think about. In 2012, the retirement segment for ING accounted for a full 49 percent of operating earnings, and individual life insurance accounted for 21 percent. Coming up, the mutual fund industry has grown to $27 trillion worldwide, and half of that money is right here in the U.S. Ty is going to talk with the CEO of Franklin Templeton. But first, a look at how the international markets fared today.
And some of the world's top mutual fund CEOs are converging here in Washington, D.C. for the annual meeting, the 55th, of the fund industry's trade group, the Investment Company Institute. Its members manage assets of more than $13.6 trillion in the U.S. alone, and they answer to about 90 million shareholders, many of whom are just like you. Greg Johnson is the current chair of ICI, and he's perhaps best known as the president and CEO of Franklin Templeton. Mr. Johnson, welcome. Good to see you again. Thank you, Tyler. Good to How's business? Business is good. It's been Money's a coming uh, strong in. first quarter, and we hope we can uh, keep that rolling. Are you seeing any change in the mix of fund flows? More into equities, less into bonds, or what? Well, I think we were pleased to see that uh, equities had a positive quarter, and that, uh, that's been against the trend for active managers here over the last couple of years. But fixed income had another huge quarter, so it wasn't one at the expense of the other. I think, we, 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 I think what we've seen is after the sequester, more money moving back into the market, um, also some tax changes at year end. So January was a record month um, at the expense of some money funds, money that's been parked and then moved into equities and fixed income. Are you having to swallow some of the expenses on money funds as so many uh, other companies are doing? We are, but for us it's a very small part. It's a very of small part of your mix. I want to play a sound bite uh, from Lloyd Blankfein earlier today because one of the comments or discussion points here uh, this week is the is the weight of regulation on business generally and most especially on the financial services business. So let's listen to Lloyd Blankfein earlier today. There's uncertainty now but I don't think spectacularly more than every than other periods that I've that I've that I've grown into now but the recent history is really what's getting everybody nervous. Mr. Blankfein basically had a Rafael Nadal serve that he could have smashed and said, regulation is worse. But he said, yeah, it's there, but we just deal with it. Is that what you see? Well, I think like any CEO, he's very careful about uh, his words when he's, when he's in public. And uh, regulation, you know, after the financial crisis, uh, Dodd-Frank and, and, you know, obviously he's very involved in, in many of the different rules that have to be written. So. Um, there's less uh, new legislation coming, but there's lots of new rules being written. So it, it's very active from, from that perspective. And I think some of the backlog, we're already three years past Dodd-Frank uh, uh, coming to life. Uh, you know, that's, that backlog has put a real, a lot of pressure on many of the different regulatory bodies to, to uh, uh, get the rulemaking out in time and and, they, and the good news is I think they're being very thoughtful about the changes because there's there are unintended consequences to many of these rules he talked about uh, the uh, Volcker rule and he basically said that he said well intentioned but the unintended consequences are really the detail here another thing he talked about was the level of risk aversion in the investment business and in American business generally let's listen to what he said there and I want to get your reaction to that as well People are nervous about taking risks. There's a huge consequence and fallout with getting things wrong. Nobody agrees on the price of, of anything. We have a, a situation where debt is very cheap, and yet nobody is borrowing to invest in their own businesses. You, given where you can borrow debt, does that mean that people think they can't get a return out of their own businesses higher than their cost of funding and their cost of money? It seems unlikely, but that's where we are today. I think what he was really driving at in part there was the idea that the financial crisis had left such deep scars that the, that the cost of getting something wrong was so intense that there's a risk aversion uh, that is lingering even today. Is that how you see it? Well, I think that's true. I mean, it, it, the, the financial crisis had a huge impact, and I think for many companies, when they don't see growth prospects, uh, they, they tend to move towards cost cutting. And even though balance sheets are healthier than ever, if we don't think that incremental investment is going to bring growth, um, and a lot of that's just based on how you feel about the economy, uh, that money's not going to be spent. So you can have liquidity, you can have easy access uh, to loans and a healthy balance sheet, but if you don't think that dollar is going to earn more than sitting on your balance sheet, uh, you know, th then you're hesitant to do that. So, you know, I, I think it just, it, it really comes to how peep the consumer feels about the direction of the country, and that's a lot of big issues. One of the things I learned about your business today is how global it is. You have offices in 30 countries. You sell in, what, 150 or 180 countries around the world. Uh, is that where the growth is for you, and is that where the growth is going to be for the mutual fund business? Well, I think for Franklin Templeton, I mean, we've been focused on building our business outside of the United States for 25 years. And like any business, we knew your household penetration will hit saturation at some point 
market here in the States. And that, that pretty much has happened. And it's a big business and a good business. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we were in places where middle classes were emerging. And I think for Franklin, having Templeton, having the network of offices, the research, and the relationships, we were able to build out distribution, build out local asset managers in many of these countries that are just growing much faster. Consumers are being created, middle classes are growing, and that's translating to mutual fund investment. You said earlier that 30 percent of your assets are out of the U.S., but 50 percent of your flows are. That really sums it all up. Greg Johnson, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Tyler. Good to see you again. Appreciate it. Sue? Ty, thanks. Rising costs were the key for both Kellogg and Kraft. Kraft earnings report beat the street. The company is saying price increases helped offset those higher commodity costs. And Kellogg basically blamed those higher costs for its lower profits. Shares of both companies ended the day off about 1%. And if you think you've been paying more for groceries, you're probably right. Prices are higher for just about everything. Jane Wells takes us down the grocery aisle. That zucchini growing. David Arcudi is growing his own food in his backyard in L.A. We planted uh, watermelon. This realtor is the parent in charge of grocery shopping for his family of four, and he says he's spending about $100 a week more than a year ago. Asparagus, $4.99 a pound. I was like, why, you know, what, where's it being grown, you know, is it gold? The federal government says overall food prices will rise about 3% this year, but new numbers show how much it costs to provide a healthy diet of groceries for a family of four. The USDA says that could run anywhere from a little over $127 a week for a thrifty shopper to more than $289 for someone who spends liberally, and this doesn't include eating out. That's anywhere from an 18 to 39 percent jump in a decade, depending on your budget. And in places like New York and New Jersey, it can cost a lot more. My groceries usually goes to five to six hundred. This year, it literally went up a hundred dollars. Probably spend like seven hundred dollars. Hopefully, they can lower the prices. But if I, ha I mean, I, I, w I can't change for my children. A gallon of milk at one grocery store might be four dollars, where at another grocery store is is two ninety nine, three bucks. Back in L.A., David Arcudi checks coupons and shops around for the lowest prices. I buy uh, chicken, steak, fish at Costco. But he realizes part of the reason his grocery bill is going up is because his kids are growing up. The USDA numbers are for a family where the kids are 11 years old or under. What about teenagers? The government says to feed a teenage boy alone can cost as much as $79 a week. That's just groceries. That doesn't even include fast food. Arcudi says his 12-year-old son tears into the food as soon as it comes home from the store, so he's fighting food inflation with a new rule. My wife and I made a rule that now that he's a teenager that his friends are not allowed to come here after school because they'll lead us out of the house and home. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Los Angeles. <laughs> Coming up, why Disney's latest superhero flick is flying high at the box office and how it's helping the company's $4 billion purchase of a comic book franchise pay off. But first, here's a look at commodities. Oil had its best day so far this year. The summer blockbuster season gets underway tonight when Iron Man 3 hits U.S. theaters. The movie has already shattered overseas box office records and is paying off big time for Disney. Julia Borston looks at how the movie is important not only to Disney's present, but its future. Go! Before Iron Man 3 opens in the U.S. this week, it's already a global hit, breaking records and grossing more than $300 million internationally, setting it up to be one of the biggest U.S. films of the year in just its first weekend, kicking off the big summer movie season and turning around months of declining sales at the box office. Disney is being very savvy about packaging this in a way, both in terms of the release date, the, the timing of the merchandising, the partnerships, the tie-ins, 
everything. When you make a $4 billion investment in Marvel, you're not gonna blow it, you're gonna capitalize on it, and that's what they're doing. Perhaps most important for Disney's global future is the foothold it's securing in China's fast-growing market. Iron Man 3 grossed $21.5 million in its first day. That's a record in Chinese box office history. Disney's partnering with Beijing-based DMG to co-produce the film in China, adding extra scenes featuring Chinese stars and Mandarin dialogue. The deal allowing the film to show on a record 6,000 screens. When a studio uh, you know, changes the content or adds content for a particular market, and in this case being China, that's a big deal and that shows you the clout of that marketplace. China is the second largest movie market behind the U.S. and is growing much faster, so the success of Iron Man 3 there should pave the way for more partnerships. Disney's not just cashing in on box office sales, but also on product placement, featuring Audi, Verizon, Fio, Subway, and Chinese electronics maker TCL and others. Plus promotional deals including Hasbro, Lego, and Oracle providing tens of millions of dollars of advertising that Marvel doesn't pay for. The film cost a reported $200 million to produce, plus much more to market. But working with brands around the world is one way Disney will yield a return on its investment. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. You know, Sue, I think you may have some of those Iron Man action figures in your future. I think I do, too, and I know you do as well, Ty. Lots of them all over the floor, <laughs> all, all the time. All over the floor. <laughs> all right, that'll do us for us on Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks so much for watching. And I'm Tyler Matheson. A reminder that Susie Garib will be in Omaha tomorrow for the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting. Have a great evening, everyone. We hope to see you right back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you by TheStreet.com, interactive financial multimedia tools for an ever-changing financial world. Our dividend stock advisor guides and helps generate income during a period of low interest rates. Options Profits helps educate beginning and seasoned options traders. Action Alerts Plus is a charitable trust portfolio that provides trade-by-trade -trade strategies. Online, mobile, social media. We are the street.com. I'm Sue Herrera with a nightly business report news brief. Stocks surged higher today, making back all of yesterday's losses. That's after first-time jobless claims fell by 18,000 last week to a five-year low. Planned layoffs declined in April and on hopes that an interest rate cut in Europe will help jumpstart the Eurozone economy. The Dow rose 130 points. The Nasdaq was up 41 on the strength of technology stocks. And the S&P 500 added nearly 15, just enough to reach another fresh all-time closing high. The U.S. trade deficit it narrowed again in March, down 11 percent for the month after imports of oil fell to the lowest level in 17 years. And 82-year-old Warren Buffett, the world's most famous investor, well, he sent his first ever tweet out today on Twitter, quote, Warren is in the house. Tune in to Nightly Business Report here on your public television station. <laughs>